And the problem is that, that they were needed uh, as agriculture grew in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, immigration from uh, previous sources of labor from China and Japan had been shut off by Congress. The Mexican government did not want its people uh, taking their skills to the United States and their money. Uh, so Mexico was very restrictive on emigration to the United States. So uh, the United States turned toward the Philippines, which uh, had uh, become an American protectorate after the Spanish-American War and a terrible war that followed. It's another story. But uh, Filipinos came to work in the, the fields of the Rio Grande Valley. 100,000 came to the United States in one year alone. And they were uh, like Italians. They were the older brothers. Their intention was to make some money, help the folks back home, eventually maybe put together enough uh, to go home and buy their own farm. Uh, you see these kinds of photographs over and over. These uh, elder brothers, the Manong generation, would send these pictures back home to mom and dad and wanted to show that they were doing okay. And these were uh, extremely hard workers. In fact, they formed a, a Masonic-like organization called the Legionnaires of Labor. Uh, this is where they could, uh, in these their meetings, where they would eat together, they would find uh, emotional support. Also, it provided uh, uh, things like health insurance for the members. So this is a very important part of the Filipino community uh, before World War II. Others joined the Navy. Uh, this is a, a Filipino crew. They're, they were stewards. They were essentially servants. That's the only rating they could aspire to. Uh, being a steward was, uh, was mostly restricted to Filipino and to black sailors. Uh, but but these, uh, these are sailors on uh, the light cruiser Seattle with a very happy looking dog uh, from 1926. It, this was true throughout the West Coast, not just in Royal Grande, but uh, conditions for the these men for this Manong generation were universally horrible. Uh, workers slept in stalls, they shared a, a common kitchen and bathroom, uh, and uh, health inspection teams from the state uh, repeatedly cited farmers for the conditions that their workers were living in. As a result, the Filipinos became organizers, and they were some of the most militant unionists in California during the 1930s. There were repeated strikes on the Napomo Mesa among uh, the pea pickers. There were three, 1934, 36, 37. But the big strike, and uh, it's in the, the photograph of those fellows on the right, the big labor strike uh, came in Salinas in 1934, and that was the lettuce strike. Before the strike broke out, there was a, there was a cannery in Salinas and the young women who worked there noticed that next to the cannery, there was a big stockade being built and it was bristling with barbed wire and it made them nervous. Well, one of the construction workers uh, uh, told one of the cannery workers Is it not to worry. That was for the Filipinos. In 1934, virtually all immigration from the Philippines was shut off. It was limited to uh, 50 a year because of the Great Depression. The problem been, had been that uh, unlike the Japanese experience, Filipinos were not allowed to immigrate. In many places in California, Filipino males outnumbered women 100 to one. So as a result, stories about their sexuality uh, were all over the front pages. Uh, this is uh, from uh, the Rio Grande Herald Recorder. It talks about a prostitution ring whose clientele was primarily Filipino. Uh, taxi dances were popular. There's a raid in Santa Maria to halt, uh, to halt a, a, a taxi dance between Caucasian women and Filipino males. And here was another one at the IDES hall uh, that was raided. But many of the men, and there's a wonderful uh, website uh, called Letters from the Heart, I think it is, uh, Cal Poly ethnic studies department maintains it and it details like the Kabaras, many of these uh, men carried on long distance uh, relationships via correspondence with young women back home and sometimes these would go on for years before they would finally marry but in other cases 
uh, Filipino men and Caucasian women became an item which horrified Californians. There was a law against marrying. Uh, what began to break that down, ironically, was World War II. And the, those were two Filipino GIs training on a heavy machine gun at Camp San Luis Obispo. And after Pearl Harbor, and uh, then the Philippine islands themselves were invaded and occupied by the Japanese, the army put out a request for a, a Filipino battalion. And they were to report to Camp San Luis Obispo to enlist. Well, they, Camp San Luis was overwhelmed. The battalion became a regiment. And so many Filipinos came to volunteer to fight that they had to form a second regiment at Camp Cook, which is today's Vandenberg. And I found this little snippet of newsreel online. And this is the first Filipino infantry regiment. The first Filipino infantry, which began with eight men and three officers, expanded to full strength under Colonel Robert F. Hoffley, a West Pointer who grew up in the Philippines. These men turned out to be superb soldiers. The soldiers detailed from the 77th Infantry Division to train them, and they, they took to soldiering almost immediately. So the first Filipino regiment, that film was shot at Camp Roberts. Then a problem came before they were to be shipped out, the first uh, Filipino regiment soldiers, and they would fight in New Guinea and, of course, in the Philippines. But some of them had fallen in love and they'd fallen in love with young Caucasian women and they wanted to get married. They couldn't out in California, that was against the law. So that uh, officer uh, you saw in the film clip at the very beginning, Colonel Offley, uh, what he did since uh, his men could not get married in California, he researched and found out that by golly, they could get married in Gallup, New Mexico. So he formed a, 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 a shuttle bus service that took his soldiers and their brides to Gallup and they came home as married couples. And Offley, who grew up in the Philippines and spoke the language Tagalog, uh, his soldiers began to refer to him as Tate. Now, one World War II hero from Morel Grande was in the Navy. This is Camilo Arcio. Camilo had been uh, one of the unionists, uh, kind of a troublemaker during the 30s a sailor in World War II. Uh, he is the father and grandfather to a couple of generations of superb athletes. Edmund Orsio, his son, played for Polly. Uh, his, uh, his children would excel in track. And two of them, I'm very proud to say, uh, became history teachers in the LUCMR Unified School District. But that was far away in 1945. Alarcio was a steward on this ship. This is the carrier Franklin. Uh, Franklin was patrolling off Kyushu, was hit by two 500 pound bombs. And the damage, as you can see, was horrific. It was the biggest single ship loss of life since Pearl Harbor. So it was devastating. Somehow, Alarcio and his shipmates kept that aircraft carrier from sinking. Not only did they keep Franklin from sinking, they turned it around and sailed back to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Alarcio <laughs> in the middle there with uh, that gaggle of grandchildren. I, I taught, I think, five of his grandchildren. And to this day, they cannot talk about their grandfather without tears coming to their eyes. He was that special. Meanwhile, back at the war, which has just ended, there was a new military campaign. The United States government decreed that soldiers who had fought for the United States were now American citizens. That they, as Americans, they uh, had to come home. Their tours would soon be over. So the next campaign was a furious series of courtships. Filipino GIs, now Americans in the Philippines, descending on eligible young women. And they courted in a hurry. Uh, one girl told uh, the young man who was uh, trying to marry her, you can't do that. You have to talk to my parents and grandparents. He said, I already have. 
and they're okay with it. So there was a flurry of marriages. This is a beautiful picture here. And these young women would come back to uh, Royal Grandy as war brides. Uh, the first thing they needed was heavy coats. They'd never been in a place as cold as California in their lives. One of them, Mrs. Petita, when, when, who had a terrific sense of humor, which her children inherited. So when I got to a Royal Grandy, it was so muddy and farmy. This is one of my, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, photographs about the Filipino experience in Royal Grandy. Uh, Pete was a GI. He fought in uh, the Philippines. And in 1949, he was the first Filipino in a Royal Grande to buy his own home on Cornwall. And this is his housewarming photo. And of course, overwhelmingly, the people at his party are, are Filipino Americans, but not all of them are. Here's Pete with his two little girls. And another sign that the, the Filipinos had arrived as Americans. This is Gabe de Leon. Uh, Gabe would become the mayor of Royal Grande, and as far as we know, the first Filipino-American mayor in history of the United States. 